Good evening. Welcome to Resource PNG. On tonight's show, we speak to Noel Smith, Director of Taxation for Deloitte, and John Holliday of Voice and Resources. But first, we join Noel Smith and discuss how personal income tax is greater than resource revenue. I have with me Noel Smith, Director of Taxation for Deloitte. It's good to see you, Noel. And you too. Thanks very much for having me. Now, looking at the budget figures, uh, personal income tax dwarfs resource revenue. Why is this so? Yes, well, when you say dwarfs, it, it, it's right, it's 40 to 44 per cent over the last two years of, of total tax revenue, um, whereas resource revenue from the mining and petroleum sectors around 13 or 14. It hasn't always been so. Back in the period around 2006 7, mining uh, resource revenues, I should say, were close to that level, but typically salary and wage has always been the backbone of tax collections here. And um, one of the reasons, of course, is that a number of resource projects have drawn back a little bit. Um, commodity prices have come off a bit. So the, the revenue generated obviously impacts on the amount of tax pay. And um, that's one of the reasons that the government, I think, is looking at not just a, a review of um, resource taxation but the tax to try and get a better balance. We've, we've seen that successive um, secretaries of treasury have noted that there is a relatively high burden on salary and wage earners in PNG. You have the situation of a number of my local colleagues who are doing well and making a career and as soon as they get to 70,000 keener they're paying a 40% rate of tax from there on up. Wow. Now in dollar terms of any denomination, that's around $30,000 and so in world terms that's a very high marginal rate at, at such a level of income and I think the government to the credit has recognised this but they of course to be able to bring salary and wage tax rates and, and takes in a consolidated revenue down they have to find sources of revenue elsewhere and I think that's why they're looking now at, at a much wider review of the tax system. Now, uh, Noel, what changes have been made to the tax credit scheme? The tax credit scheme as we knew it at the start of the year has not changed at all and resource companies are still entitled to tax credits for project expenditure where that's been approved by uh, Department of National Planning. As you might be aware these are for community based projects in rural and remote areas, things such as aid posts, schools, bridges, that type of thing. Um, and a very worthy cause. And they've always been entitled to a tax credit of 0.7, a maximum 0.75% of income. That persists. But there was a change in the middle of the year for a while where it was thought that it might be better for projects of national impact to have a, a much improved or extended, if you like, tax credit scheme so that far more credit could be given to taxpayers if they were prepared to fund specific government priority projects and you might be aware that the pineapple building is currently being funded in that way but then on a on a relook according to the the uh, ministers in the budget lock up and discussions since um, they've thought that well the government has thought that we probably should go back to basics so that that type of expenditure doesn't in any way contradict with the general budget priorities year on year so that extended scheme only really lasted from June this year until the date of the budget. More of this interview after the break. Welcome back. We continue our interview with Noel Smith. Now you've mentioned the uh, government's uh, tax review. What impact do you think that might have on the resource sector? Well I think it's, it's probably likely to have an impact on every sector but quite clearly the resource sector. Uh, there was as you know an intention to review the resource taxation system more broadly and we understand that the IMF has, has been to PNG and assisted the government with at least an initial review. Um, but what form that would take is yet uncertain. Minister Duma in his address to the Petroleum Conference on Tuesday mentioned that he believed that some sort of hybrid system for resource taxation might eventuate. It could result in higher rates of, of tax uh, for resource companies or some sort of extra resource rent tax like uh, other jurisdictions have imposed across the world with varying degrees of success. But um, one would hope whatever happens it's, it, it doesn't 
introduce a lot more complexity. And I think the government, uh, certainly in its written and, and um, spoken statements, has been quite keen to emphasise that the tax review right across, and including resource taxation, needs to come up with an outcome where we've had a simpler, more competitive and fairer tax regime. Is it your opinion, Noel, that we have quite a complex tax system at the moment? Um, in many respects, the PNG tax system isn't particularly complex. Uh, one of the drawbacks uh, and one of the problems government faces is that there are a number of um, entities and persons in PNG who should be in the tax net that aren't. And you would have seen in the budget additional revenue for the Internal Revenue Commission, a substantial additional revenue, and one would uh, uh, imagine that uh, a big outcome of that will be extra compliance activities because um, we talked about those high rates of individual tax early, company tax. There's, there's a number of SME entities, individuals who aren't in the tax net who, who should be. Um, it will obviously have an impact on them. But it, it could, look, it's very hard to, at this stage, predict the committee that's um, oversighting the review is composed of eminent people. They've undertaken that they will consult broadly. So one would hope that what comes out of it is a better system than we have now and one that is no more complex because that's the killer from a tax policy perspective to have very complex laws that uh, are difficult to administer because your cost of administration for the IRC goes up and the cost of understanding for the, the business and taxpayer community also goes up. There's some changes to the certificate of compliance. Is this going to be of any benefit to the resource sector? Commendable changes and, and a benefit to both um, the resource sector, um, business taxpayers generally and also the IRC uh, in, in the sense that um, there were very low levels of threshold for payments to service providers um, in that system as it stood, dating a 500 kina threshold for a payment to a service provider in, uh, in that was from a certain profession or industry, and that goes back to 1992. Now they've, they've increased that to 5,000, which takes a lot of smaller players out, got rid of a, an aggregation policy that they used to have, well, it, even if it was under the threshold, if it was more than a certain amount a year, you still had to, from one business to another service provider, you still had to consider the business payments tax obligations and certificate of compliance issues. That's now gone. And, and uh, probably the, the biggest bonus is that they have removed a number of categories of um, professions and activities from the, from the reach of the system altogether. And in terms of the, the mining and resource sector, uh, key amongst those would be engineers, architects, surveyors and other consultants. So a lot, of, a lot of people who provide services to the industry will not now have to worry about being in possession of a certificate of compliance. And the other thing is too, it, it alleviates the burden, the administrative burden on the IRC, who used to have lots and lots of people turning up to try and get their certificate of compliance when they're quite law abiding in many cases. Um, and it's a low risk to revenue or very small amounts of tax in any case. Might, um, might it also make it a lot easier to do your books at the end of the year? Well, it, for, for those um, businesses who are registered for the business payment system as a paying authority, it, it will reduce their compliance costs, that's for sure, yes. And for those who aren't brought within the system, they don't have to worry about getting paper forms called P7s to substantiate credits when they lodge their return right. where those have been taken out previously. Noel, thank you for your time today. Thank you very much. Noel Smith, Director Taxation for Deloitte. More Resource PNG when we return. You're with Resource PNG. We now take a look at this presentation by Noel Smith and further look into the 2014 National Budget. The, the budgets are, again, as mentioned by the ministers in their presentation at the budget lockup, an historic one. And again, it's, a, it's the biggest budget that PNG has seen. You see the revenue numbers here. Um, that's an increase of 2.2 billion or 21 per cent on the 2013 revised figures. So, major expected increase in revenue 
and you'll see that the bulk of that again comes from income and profits taxes. And I thought I might just do a, a breakdown of the main components of that. And you'll see from this that you've got personal income tax still bearing 40% plus of the burden in 14 um, and historically for 13. General company tax around 35%. Mining and petroleum tax 13 to 14%. And for those of you who were here um, in the middle part of the first decade of this century, around 2006 7 you might recall that at that stage, mining and petroleum taxes were rivaling personal income tax in terms of contribution to the budget at around 40%. So there's been a marked change in that in my time here. And in terms of the headline numbers for expenditure, um, I'm not sure, I don't think the Prime Minister mentioned it, but this year the government um, consolidated its development and recurrent expenditure budgets into one and also started on some multi-year budgeting for projects such that the budget for next year includes a certain amount but that project's funded out. Um, these are the headline expenditure numbers. I've just highlighted in red those that I think may be of most interest to this sector and you'll see that the biggest increase is infrastructure. And that bears out, again, what we heard earlier this morning about the government's intention to try and fund improvements and also counter that, de that expected decrease in the construction industry into 2014. So we end up with a deficit of 2.6 billion, or 5.9%, which is slightly higher than the previous year of 2.5 billion. And that's just within the government's range under the Fiscal Responsibility Act of, 30, of debt to GDP ratio of 35%. They've mentioned that they see that trending downwards um, in the next couple of years to about 30%. We might touch on that a bit later. Just briefly, in framing the expenditure budget, the government's expressed these key priorities and they're all in keeping with the medium-term fiscal strategy. Again, infrastructure, construction of new roads along with funding for maintenance, expand health and education spending, the Sovereign Wealth Fund and the consolidation of the Kumul, under the Kumul entities that we heard about earlier, strengthening of law and order and an improvement in the business environment. Within those priorities, just things of, of interest for the current year, I thought that we could draw out. Particular um, universities there includes tertiary education institutions, technical colleges, and at the budget lockup, um, the Minister for National Planning made much of the fact that they really want to increase the availability of technical skills in the resource sector and other sectors, and this is one way they see of doing that. Now, in terms of the, the tax changes, and we'll discuss these in a little bit more detail. Um, as we go on. You would have noted, hopefully, that funding and revenue targets for both the IRC and Customs have been substantially increased. The R&D concession has been withdrawn as of 1 January and there's changes, positive changes, I must say, all round to the Certificate of Compliance regime and infrastructure tax credit changes which shouldn't dramatically affect the sector in the historic way that it's known this scheme to be administered. There were some minor changes which I'll just mention um, to allow the Commissioner General here to exchange uh, information with the new Bougainville Tax Authority, the Tax Review Committee which we will touch on again and Tax Refunds Mechanism for Income Tax which previously had a special appropriation in the budget, a ridiculously low sum, and even Government and Secretary Vallée would remember this, was, was uh, unable for IRC to meet those commitments. Now it's going to be funded from their general revenue streams. So I'm thinking, what are the things that this might mean for the sector and us generally? Um, with the increased funding for IRC, we can certainly expect increased compliance activity. Um, 
that's been a, a critical player in um, IRC not being able to generate the revenue that they might like to have in previous years because of lack of resources. They've been funded quite substantially to increase those resources and I think a number of you can perhaps expect in the years to come some further um, inquiries from IRC just to check that things are running well. Hopefully one, one good thing out of this will be that people who are not in the net and should be, and there's a number of those, particularly in the SME small business sector, might be brought into the net, which will decrease pressure on other revenue streams for the government. Um, the IRC have also at the same time implemented or are implementing a new computer system called SIGTAS, which some of you may be aware of. That's already having some effect in that those clients, which are generally larger clients to start with, who've been migrated to that system, um, are finding that their affairs are managed automatically, and so late payments for things such as group tax or other withholding taxes and starting to attract some automatic penalties, whereas in past these were manually issued. We've had several instances in the last month of clients having penalties automatically imposed, and at least in one of those cases where there were substantial GST offsetting credits available. Um, so I think there's going to be more pressure on making sure, that this, particularly at the contractor service provider level two resource companies, there'll be a lot of entities that are in that position on an ongoing basis, something I think we need to be aware of. The R&D concessions, um, some of you would be aware that when these first were proposed in 2004, they were intended as part of the Green Revolution measures for the agriculture sector, but on the way through Parliament, the measures were amended to include all industries. Now, since that time, our understanding is that the major um, submissions to the IRC and the committee that is supposed to guide them um, are from resource companies, and you will be aware, no doubt, that the government has said that the potential revenue foregone is blown out to a level that they just can't sustain. So that system is now repealed. For those of you who've got existing claims in there, I think you can expect considerable scrutiny of those as the IRC and the committee wants its reconstituted work their way through them. We'll be back with more of this presentation when we return. Thanks for staying with us. We continue the presentation with Noel Smith of Deloitte. The COC regime has been, um, I think, upgraded quite properly to keep pace with the times. The previous payment threshold was 500 kina, and that was set in 1992. It's now been upgraded to 5,000 kina for one payment and no aggregate amount over that. So as long as your payment to an entity is less than 5,000 kina, no need to seek a CIC anymore. Now, coupled with that, um, they did tell me that it's expected that under that computer system I mentioned earlier, SIGTAS, that for compliant taxpayers who are on that system, that CICs will be automatically generated for you into the future where you're subject to that regime. And that's the other bonus about the changes. It's taken out quite a lot of people or um, activities or services that would have otherwise been subject to the regime, professional services being one, accountants, doctors, lawyers, engineers, etc. So it's, it's fined down the focus of the regime. They've done um, studies internally that indicate the entities now taken out aren't, don't pose a great risk and that they've always been relatively compliant. Infrastructure tax credits. Um, came as a surprise to some of us actually that there had been an extension to the regime part way through this year in June um, and that was designed to facilitate projects of national importance because the, the regime, as it did exist and continues to exist, had limitations on the maximum amount of tax credits that could be claimed. That still persists in the general regime that you would be aware of in getting approval through the national planning first before undertaking project expenditure exists and will continue to be administered. Well, as indicated, the tax review is now one of all components of the PNG tax system looking to improve 
simplicity, fairness, competitiveness in the system, and within that, of course, a review of resource taxation. And in particular, one of the committee scopes that were mentioned in the budget papers include consider options to change the tax mix between the levels of tax on land, including resources, capital and labour. Now, what that could mean is quite wide, and we've had some indications, I think, this morning in the resource taxation area that, from Minister Duma that there could be some changes to the Division 10 provisions to a more hybrid system than what we've got now. Um, it could involve rate changes, could involve changes to allowable exploration or capital expenditure provisions, um, and a whole range of other issues. We don't know, but the committee um, that's established is to report to government in March 2015 and have promised that they will consult widely in the interim to gauge people's views and then to get further comments on draft proposals. Other things that could be in the mix to be considered, a revised GST regime that could involve rate considerations or considerations of removing some of the existing zero rating or concessional provisions. Um, could involve capital gains tax consideration, which is one area that PNG traditionally doesn't have. I would say, though, that our early feedback from the committee indicates there's not a lot of appetite for that tax at the moment. And that's probably fair enough in that stamp duty, which in a, a de facto way substitutes for that here, still garners quite a lot of revenue across the board. But um, if you want a better tax system and you want particularly the burden that we saw earlier on salary and wage tax earners, who as a percentage of the population are about 17%, if we want that burden decreased, then extra tax revenue has to be found elsewhere. And that's either new sources of tax or increased taxes elsewhere. Just some other issues that came out of things in the budget paper that we thought, well, do these mean a general shift or are they just one-off changes? You might have noticed in the earlier slide on income that 600 million kina was projected from asset sales by the government. And as it turns out, that's a percentage stake in the PNG LNG project, which they intend to send, uh, sell apparently sometime in the coming year. Now, whether that's indicative of a general change that they may be happier with a lesser rate than their normal carrying these projects, 22.5% could be. It might also be indicative of the fact that, um, and as was mentioned, there's other potential projects very much in the wing, both in the petroleum sector and the mining sector. If economic and other conditions change such that those came on stream more quickly than it's presently thought, the government equity funding requirements would be very, very substantial. So it could be some thoughts of how they manage that going forward. And one thing to mention about that is that, again, the government's very keen, has been very particular in this and the previous year's budget, to stick to that 35% maximum debt to GDP ratio. So that imposes its own limits on debt funding capacity. The appropriations in the budget, uh, I think we all agree, are very commendable, particularly infrastructure, law and order, tertiary education. Uh, but the budget itself and the speeches by the various ministers on the day of the lockup indicated that at the time of the budget only 52% of the funds allocated from that year's budget had been actually spent on the ground. They could increase by the end of the year and then the next few weeks and perhaps will, but it's indicative of the, the constraints that particularly public service agencies find in implementing a lot of these proposals. And uh, both the Treasurer and the Minister for Finance were very proactive in their budget speeches of, uh, about exhorting public servants to firstly scope and plan well for these projects and then to make sure they can be implemented in the year in which funding is available. So that's 
if that works, I think that'll be a real bonus for the sector. But we all know it's quite difficult, particularly in rural and remote areas. The Sovereign Wealth Fund. Um, that's a, a concept that I think across all industries is broadly supported. There were indications in the budget that that may be modified somewhat, whether that would mean any amount or greater amounts being held onshore than the previously proposed offshore arrangements. We're not sure, but um, I think the, the key thing is to get the legislation in so there's certainty throughout industry and the, and the economy more generally. Uh, Minister Duma mentioned the Common Entities restructure. And I think there'd be hope across the room that uh, once that's undertaken, and as I understand it, that's largely a, a split of the existing Petromin responsibilities and some others uh, moved into these structures, that things might be a bit easier in terms of negotiating or being project partners with the state. And certainly the PM was very supportive of taking, um, of those entities taking a very active role in terms of their membership of boards and, the, um, and his idea that they could help push professionalism at a greater level in some of these projects. And um, lastly, the, I don't think that would be a surprise to anyone, the overall sector outlook is for a one-off growth factor of 354% next year and, um, and with further substantial growth into 2015. Now, whilst there's no specific other plan for the sector in the budget papers, um, there are a number of things that could impact on these projections. The, and I might just mention the, the oil price that they've used in those projections is $99 a barrel for the 2014 year, and then an even 95 for the three or four years out after that. But probably the big sleeper is the second LNG project, which um, if it comes on would revise, I think, a number of, of these estimations, certainly for future years. So that's all I've really got to say on things that at least we think might affect or will obviously affect the sector. Um, it is a bold budget and let's very much hope that the positive things that we've tried to highlight do come to, uh, come to fruition. So I'd like to thank you for your attention and time this morning. Resource PNG continues when we come back. Welcome back. We now talk to John Holliday of Voice and Resources. We find out more about this small junior company, particularly their three major projects with Iron Sands and two other large copper and gold projects. Thank you, Mr. Holliday, for your participation here on Resource PNG. Can you give us a background on Voice and Resources? Uh, yeah, Voice on Resources is a small junior company based in Sydney, Australia, listed on the ASX, and it's uh, particularly focused on what we consider to be three world-class projects in Papua New Guinea. Uh, one of those is an iron sands project, it's a major iron project in Papua New Guinea, and the other two are uh, large porphyry copper gold projects on the islands of Papua New Guinea. Uh, you know, Papua New Guinea is highly prospective and uh, a good development location for these resources, and we're particularly focused on resources that are near the coasts and on the islands because that is a place that you can develop projects with uh, lower capital cost and uh, less uh, infrastructure and logistical problems. Uh, and that means you've got a much better chance of getting them into operation sooner and therefore you know, make a profit sooner. What is your company's strategy at the moment? Well, that's basically is our strategy as I just explained. It's to focus on those three projects mm -hmm. and to move them forward as quickly as we can. We have to get finance in to do that with the uh, Iron Sands project. We actually do have a joint venture with TVI Pacific to advance that one. And with the Copper Gold projects, we're looking to get partners so we can get drilling and show their real potential. Could you give us some details on the Amazon Bay Iron Sands project? Yeah, sure. Um, Amazon Bay is uh, down the coast from Port Moresby. I think it's about 100 kilometres. It's right on the coast. Uh, there's a lot of... Uh, black sand beaches and black sand dunes there and these are rich in uh, iron specifically magnetite which also contains titanium and vanadium there's some alluvial gold and possibly also heavy minerals like zircon and il ilmenite and monazite um, there's uh, a very large resource potential there 
uh, we're planning to move forward and lead that into a, a, a major uh, development project with uh, direct shipping of iron sands offshore. Uh, I can tell you quite a lot of details about that if you'd like. Um, the exploration target is uh, in two areas. In the Threadfin area we have a target of 630 million tonnes. Now that is just a target under the Australian JORP code. And in, in the Deba Margarita area there is an old non-JORP compliant resource of 445 million tonnes. So if you just add those together you've got a target of over a billion tonnes. Um, what we have to do is uh, prove these into resources with a sonic drilling program. Uh, sonic drilling gives you a very good sample quality and enables you to determine what grades you've got very effectively. Uh, we've done a scoping study on this whole project to justify moving to this resource stage and that scoping study um, was done by Ingenium for us. Uh, I can't give you the actual financial figures because it's based on an exploration target but it showed a capex of about $150 million Australian, operating costs of around $26 Australian per tonne and uh, the idea is to dredge the sands much like a mineral sands operation, uh, process with uh, spirals, cyclones and magnetic concentration in a concentrating plant at site and then uh, produce a mass yield concentrate of about 10% which would then be taken on lighters out to a ship, um, put onto ships and transported to the further processing which could be in PNG uh, or somewhere else in Asia. Yeah, that's the plan. What are your immediate plans for the project? Well our immediate plans are in 2014 to uh, do the resource sonic drilling program and and get ourselves an inferred resource initially and then a, a, an indicated resource so that we can convert it into reserves and uh, then do a pre-feasibility study and ultimately a, a bankable feasibility study if, if we can pursue these things efficiently, you know, weather permitting and all those things then uh, hopefully by you know, 2016 perhaps even we could have a direct shipping ore operation in, in the region. Um, there is no need to build a, a port. We can have the boats offshore behind the protection of the local reef and uh, take the products straight off. Mm. Mm. Could you give us some details of your copper gold projects? Yes, uh, the copper gold projects are uh, semi-advanced sort of partly brownfields type projects and they've both been explored by major companies but many decades ago and those companies left them behind because back then copper prices were much lower and they thought they perhaps were not quite good enough and also um, because of other factors like um, one of them was explored by ESO they left that behind because they uh, moved out of minerals mainly a petroleum company and the other one was uh, with CRA who were scared off by the Bougainville situation so Firstly, the CRA one is called a TUI, the XCRA project, sorry, is called a TUI. It's on uh, southern New Britain. Um, we've drilled one hole there last year. Uh, has 102 metres of 0.13% copper. And we have a large IP geophysical anomaly that requires considerably more drill testing. Um, it indicates that we could be onto quite a significant porphyry copper gold system. Uh, the other project is Lagusalem on New Island. Uh, it's down the coast along the coastal road from Kaviang. It uh, was drilled by Swiss Aluminium and then further explored by ESSO in the 70s and 80s. Uh, 22 drill holes by Swiss Aluminium. The deepest uh, was only a couple of hundred metres. The average depth only 115 metres. Yet they got quite encouraging intersections, 0.2% to 0.36% range uh, in copper. Uh, no gold analyses. Um, it's totally underexplored by modern standards. Yet you know, it's, a, it's a really encouraging target. And its exploration of these, going back to exploring further these old targets that often leads to significant discoveries. That's the success of the Morobi Mining Joint Venture at Golpu 
and uh, of Newcrest Mining in Australia at Cadia. It's exploring old prospects more thoroughly can lead to uh, um, a good chance of discovery. So with these projects, are you excited for the year ahead, for the potentials? Yeah, yeah, quite excited. I mean, they're, they're all three projects in Foison are, are really high quality um, and they're more, you know, Amazon Bay is definitely an absolute, you know, advanced project. Um, the copper gold ones are sort of, they're just not at the grassroots level, they're up there at the, the discovery drilling stage and, and that's what's needed, just some drilling there and I'm sure there's a good chance of a discovery. Thank you Mr Holliday for your time here on Resource PNG. Okay, thanks Michaelina. And that was Mr John Holliday, Director for Voice and Resources. We'll be back with more after the break. You're watching Resource PNG. We now take a look at this presentation by John Holliday of Voice and Resources. We're focused pretty closely now on, on what are three main projects, uh, Iron Sands at Amazon Bay and two copper gold projects in the islands. We're really focused on coastal and island areas because that provides much lower cost development and favourable logistics and that's crucial in PNG. I mean, that is why Frida River's still there. If it was near the coast, I'm sure it would be a mine now. Um, and I hope they do get that going, but it's, it's much easier if you're somewhere where you, you can just put the stuff on a ship so easily and get in and out very easily without having to build huge amounts of roads, etc. Uh, Amazon Bay is, is our flagship project. Uh, it's a very large iron sands project uh, and the credits include vanadium, titanium, gold, possibly mineral sands as well along with the, uh, the magnetite sands. Um, we also have two outstanding under-drilled but relatively large and advanced porphyry copper deposit opportunities, the Tui in uh, southern New Britain and uh, Lagusalem on the central New Island. And that's a map showing you the, the locations of the projects there. Um, this point of work here, Amazon Bay down the coast here from Moresby, Atui there and uh, Lagusalem there. Now a close up and we'll focus on Amazon Bay for a while now. This is just showing the, the location more closely and the, uh, the tenant package stretching along the coast and including offshore, but the main focus is on uh, EL1396 right in along the coast here. Uh, the ownership of this project, it's, it's uh, owned basically by Titan Mines Limited, which is a 100% owned subsidiary of Foison. Um, Foison owns 50% of the shares in Titan Mines through New Guinea Iron Proprietary Limited, that's a 100% owned subsidiary. Um, we have a five-year option to acquire the other 50% from the other partners and uh, we now have a joint venture with TVI Pacific wherein they can earn up to 30% of Foison's share of the project. And of course, if, that, if it all proceeds, we'll exercise our option and have full ownership. The, uh, the targets and strategy at Amazon Bay, well... Firstly, in the 70s, AOG Minerals did quite a bit of work there and uh, reported a, what would have to be called non-JORC compliant, um, because it's, it's before JORC really came in, uh, a resource of uh, 450 million tonnes of plus 10% magnetics uh, from quite a lot of drilling there. You can see 785 holes. That's at the uh, Deba Margarita area. And then subsequently, Foison has flown an airborne survey which uh, has demonstrated potential from both radiometric and magnetic signatures for a, a huge resource also at Threadfin and we have an exploration target there we've put together of 630 million tonnes. Uh, we have a plan to explore all this utilising sonic drilling and get a resource estimate going in 2014 and then the strategy is uh, to produce a concentrate on site and ship for processing offshore uh, I'll show you much more about this in the next lot of slides. Uh, and metallurgically treat it, separate the high purity vanadium and titanium products and sell the iron and any subsidiary gold and mineral sands. So this is the radiometrics that highlights the uh, potential here and an air airborne shot that highlights the coastal situation and you've got these strand lines or dunes um, stretching across to the ocean 
and they're highlighted here in the radiometrics, for instance, because of their monazite content. And this is the thread fin area, which is, has the 630 million ton target area. This is Diva Margarita here, where the AOG drill grid was, just there. And you can see these features spread right along the fringes of the coast, and then here become, extend much further inland. Uh, this is a delta from a river coming in here, and that's part of the way you get this, of course. This is bringing down the heavy sands and they're getting spread up along the coast. This is another view looking from the west, back along through the radiometrics. This is Threadfin, Diva Margarita up here, and this is a plan generalised of our proposed sonic drilling program, firstly to uh, scout out the potential and then turn certain areas into a, a, an infer inferred resource. And what do we get at the end of all this? Well, basically, you know, we have this target for vanadiferous titanomagnetite sands. This product is commonly used in New Zealand by Blue Scope. And there's a project in Fiji, Amex's MBA Delta project, which is perhaps a little bit more advanced than ours. They're in a resource stage. And uh, the market for these products is, is quite good in, in China and, and in Asia. Um, increasing demand for this product uh, because the Chinese are finding their own high-cost uh, mines uh, for this sort of product uh, getting just too high a cost and, and, and looking for replacements for that, for that ore source. Um, in the metallurgy, we're looking at a mass yield in the concentrate offshore of about 10% or above 10%. And uh, metallurgical test work has been largely concentrated so far on the Diva Margarita area. Uh, that's looking quite promising. We're getting a magnetic concentrate mass yield of 40.3%. And, and that's after we've had 25.7%, so you finish up with a total mass yield of 10%. There's also a good potential for alluvial gold at uh, Diva Grid. Uh, samples were giving up to 0.15 grams per tonne alluvial gold, and uh, that certainly would be a very handy credit. And that photo there shows one of the rivers coming in with its iron sands delta. So earlier this year, uh, we conducted a scoping study which was carried out by Ingenium and that was completed in September. This is the uh, company that worked on the Fiji project for Amex and uh, so they have good experience in putting together the costs and, and uh, understand the issues with these projects very well. Um, a list of the things that the study assessed there and I can show you some of the results of that. Um, the concept for processing is really like a a mineral sands project yeah, on the east coast of Australia. So you have your dredge and then take it offshore to ships just offshore. Now the advantage at Amazon Bay is there's a bit of an offshore reef but with plenty of gaps through it so you could set up a sort of port facility relatively easily there without having to worry about protecting it from big swells or anything like that. And uh, there's some concept ideas of how you'd get this concentrate on the ship and take it to somewhere else in port in Papua New Guinea or possibly to directly to China. The project financials, well the base case looked at uh, dredging 15 million tonnes per annum and producing uh, 1.56 million tonnes per annum of concentrate. Um, of course it's a scoping study so plus or minus about 30 to 35 per cent uh, and unfortunately we can't give you all the NPV etc financial out outcomes because we're still working this on an exploration target status and the dual code doesn't let us uh, tell you all those things. But we can tell you a few things. This is a capital cost estimate out of it and you can see coming in at about 150 million Australian. Um, so it's quite feasible even for a relatively small company to uh, put something like this together and get it going. And I'm sure it can be scaled up in similar incre increments over time quite easily, much as I guess they're um, planning to do there at, at uh, Frida River now. Operating cost estimate as well, so you're down there about $26, $27 a tonne. Uh, it's all sort of well known, simple technology and uh, pretty straightforward really, so uh, uh, should, should be able to be done relatively easily. 
So the key is now to get going with our forward work program and in the next couple of years get a long way towards a bankable feasibility study, hopefully. Uh, we've got a, a program coming up with the sonic drilling to get a mineral resource, get fully comprehensive metallurgy done, assess further the mining processing, logistics, shipping options, get the environmental and uh, social community studies going, marketing opportunities and uh, you know, move it forward. And there's a, a project timeline, this is a fairly uh, aggressive one, uh, but if everything comes together, quite achievable because, as I pointed out, it's, it's not that complex a thing to do. Um, and, and that's the big advantage of, of a project like this, that it can be mined really cheaply, transported really cheaply, and even if the metallurgy isn't as perfect as oxide hematite ore from Western Australia, um, you're just going to get it to market a hell of a lot cheaper than that stuff. And just to uh, finish with the last few slides on our other main projects, and this is uh, two key gold and copper projects that we're now focused on. Foison's recently relinquished a number of projects and decided it really has to get focused in the current environment and take these forward. Um, we all know this is elephant country for big porphyry copper deposits. Um, my view and my experience is that uh, exploration of known under-drilled deposits is a lower risk path to major new discovery and going for the complete greenfields approach. It's sort of like you find these greenfields projects um, that are relatively advanced, so they're sort of half brownfields. Uh, Cadia was a good example of that. Golpu is another example in recent times in PNG of that. And if you can get onto these projects and go and drill them properly and to depth, much more so than the past explorers did, you've got a much better chance of making a big discovery. And we've got two of these projects in Poisson, Lagusalem on New Ireland and Atui in New Britain. Um, just going to Lagusalem first, we've just got one slide on this. This is uh, uh, down the coast from Kaviang. No, there is a road down the coast here. Uh, Lagusalem mineralisation outcrops in this area here. This is a limestone plateau up here. Uh, there's quite a bit of evidence this could be a caldera. It may, may, may or may not be. Um, a lot of scree coming off this escarpment and covering things up, so there's not really that much outcrop. Lots of evidence from rock chips and so on of uh, extensive uh, mineralisation over a much bigger area than's ever been adequately explored. In the 70s, Swiss aluminium did... 22 drill holes in here, in a focused area. The average depth was only 115 metres and they got some long intersections in quite a lot of those holes with the best one averaging uh, about 0.36% over about 60 metres. And basically there's been no new exploration since. I mean, people go in, have a look, take a few rock chips, repeat what everyone's done before. It's just wasted effort really. You've got to get in there and drill these things. So by modern standards, this is absolutely un underexplored and our plan is to get in there and uh, do an IP survey, deep drilling. In fact, we're looking, actively looking for a partner to fund Titan uh, to do this. And Atui, uh, we did manage to get in here and do one drill hole uh, last year and there's a section of that up there. Um, significant assay results from the hole, 102 metres uh, from... 45 metres at 0.13% copper. It's in this upper part here, as you can see. It's quite a bit of molybdenum around as well. Um, this is uh, only a couple of kilometres in from the coast on the south side of, uh, of New Britain. Uh, it's uh, a tenement totally surrounded by uh, the PNG mining tenements. And uh, this is our IP survey and a bit of the core, show the core showing uh, veining and alteration in... Uh, uh, some biotite alteration as well, and, and you can read that for yourself there, but quite encouraging indicators from a first hole. And this is the IP survey, chargeability at 100 metres depth. The holes there goes this way, and uh, there are you know, a number of ways to interpret this. One is that this is the uh, chalcopyrite core of a porphyry system, which has lower chargeability than the pyritic halo around it, or the alternative is that the drilling was going out of it and this is actually where we should have been targeting over on these anomalies over here. So it's quite early days, but, but this is 
quite a significant area of um, mineralisation on surface. I haven't shown you the geochem, but it's not enough time. But it was mapped out by uh, CRA in 1986, and they left it behind because they were just scared off of PNG by then because of the developing Bougainville experience and, uh, and probably thought it just wasn't quite big enough for them. Okay, so that's uh, a quick focus on Foison's main projects and uh, I'd like to say thank you very much. That ends Resource PNG. If you have any comments or queries, do email us on this address, resourcepng at mtv.com.pg. Or to find out more, check MTV online. That's www.mtv.com.pg and go to our Resource PNG page. Or you can check our page on Facebook. Until the same time next week, bye for now.